Excuse us. Pardon me, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Move it, asshole. Oh, thank God. We got good seats. Damn right we did. What's up? We got the drink. We got the popcorn. And the candy. I think we're ready, man. Hey, guys. Sorry I'm late. The bathroom here is nuts. Oh, my God. You made it. Yeah. It's about time, Nathan. Damn. Shh. The movie's starting. Hey there. I'm Nathan Simmons. And I am Dustin Goes to Hollywood, and you were listening to the Silver Linings Playlist featuring the Jaded Three, a.k.a. the two bros and artists formerly known as Not an Intel <laughs> podcast. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a mouthful now. It is. Uh, this is a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's bleakest endings yeah and we don't and we don't have a movie that premiered in uh and shared in wyoming this week we it's don't. very different and you know what it's i'm here to say it i'm a bit of a hypocrite because <laughs> this movie is well over two hours this is the longest movie we've done this season but but, <laughs> but i don't i don't feel the runtime in this one like i do for other movies we've done i completely agree okay. i think this movie is all killer no filler mm -hmm. uh and and the pacing in this movie is insanely good yes. I, I actually remember because i saw i was gonna give you shit for the runtime <laughs> and i i paused the movie at one point and realized i was already like an hour and 15 minutes in and i was mm -hmm. like that flew by yep yeah this movie this movie's great <laughs> thank you i'm so glad to know you feel that way since this is your first time seeing it yeah regular listeners of the show will realize they're not hearing the third voice on our on our show and that's because mally uh is dead so <laughs> recipes mally he's somewhere in a hole <laughs> yeah. with a trans am part over it and a whistle and they can faintly hear that's right um but yeah he is sadly will not be joining us on this episode even though he he really wanted to uh work duty calls yeah and you know so we got a filler and someone who's already planning on being on the show anyway, so it kind of worked out great. Yeah. Um, returning from the super episode, episode 99, you, you got in at the last, the last <laughs> double digit episodes and now you're joining us for the three digits. It's Kobe Evans joining us. Yay. Woo. Hey guys. Uh, I am happy to be uh, Mally's filler. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let him know you said that. <laughs> Straight up. Yeah. <laughs> We've upgraded. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so guys, we're talking about prisoners. Yeah. Ooh. Nathan, this was your first time seeing it. Kobe, I feel like you've probably seen this a lot. Am I wrong? Uh, lots of times. This yeah. is the one I go to if someone's like, show me a good movie. Thank and you. And I know they won't hate me for it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. You can't do like me and Mally do. We'll tell people to watch Buried for the first time <laughs> oh and God. be like, come back. Oh, I also do that. <laughs> I have very judgmental friends, though, so I have to pick my... Uh, my my movies carefully sure sure so uh prisoners if if you are not aware listener this was somehow a big movie and not a big movie because yeah. i didn't hear about this movie until years after it came out well i feel like it was also overshadowed by enemy which came out the same year mm -hmm. oh. but this movie is um comfortably in my top five of all time wow like, i think I think it's a fucking masterpiece, and I, I might get flack for this. I think it's Villeneuve's best movie. Blade Runner 2049 is a close second, Ooh, yeah. but this movie is perfect to me. Like, it, I find no fault faults in it no flaws whatsoever wow so yeah yeah man this was uh i'm so glad i finally got around to watching it because i love denny villeneuve mm -hmm. and i i've been a fan since sicario which i know yeah. is still like kind of uh roughly halfway through his filmography mm -hmm. um i've tried to go back and like fill in the gaps but this is one i i never watched and i think it i think the runtime actually intimidated me i think it was one of those things where it was like Anytime I was in the mood to watch a a heavy movie, I st I wasn't in the mood to watch a two and a half hour heavy movie. You sure. know what I mean? Sure. And so, but yeah, Denny Villeneuve, he he doesn't miss. He doesn't miss. He doesn't miss. I will say this, and I this I may definitely get flack for. Uh, I think he's the best working director we have today. Huge. And fan. I say that knowing there are Nolans out there and Spielbergs <laughs> and everything else, I think he. Like you said, he doesn't miss. Remember what didn't didn't I go off on a thing like or like last year where I was like, why? Why the fuck isn't Villeneuve making a Bond movie? Yeah. Oh, my God. That'd be awesome. When when are we getting that? <laughs> like, I want, yeah. like, I want that so bad. It would be incredible. I mean, he 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 also always pairs himself with the best actors. Mm -hmm. He's got the best cinematographer in the business, you yep. know, w working with them at all times. Uh, you know, up until a few years ago when he, he sadly passed, he had Johan Johansson yep. composing his music. Yep. I mean, the dude doesn't fucking miss. <laughs> and this is uh, the eight year anniversary of the movie Prisoners. And also, this was the perfect time to do it because, of course, Dune is on the horizon, which is set up to be beautiful, a two parter. <laughs> 
So yeah, and I'm excited because I've never seen the David Lynch one, mm. never read the book. So <laughs> I'm I'm going in baby faced and I'm excited for it. Um, awesome, man. Plus the cast looks it's fucking outstanding for Dune. So. Yeah, it, it's a great cast. Can you imagine if Zendaya was in the Hugh Jackman role in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I just with her with the hammer breaking the sink. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I I think I might buy it. Yeah. I might buy it to that. <laughs> No, so, okay, so Prisoners, if if you're not aware, listener, this is, I don't even know where this is in his filmography. This is the same year as Enemy, as you mentioned, so mm-hmm. it's before Sicario and Arrival, yeah, and all of the the bigger known uh, Denis Villeneuve movies. I think this may be his first English-speaking movie, if I'm not mistaken. It is, yeah. Okay. I think Enemy might have dropped earlier, yeah. um, but I but I think this was the first one that he, yeah, that he shot. It's, it's man... To to be so fortunate to work with Roger Deakins on every movie you've done, like I know, oof. <laughs> I know. And he's is he doing Dune? Uh, yeah, yeah. Deakins is shooting Dune. Oh, yeah. thank God. So we're in good hands. So uh, oh no, I'm sorry. Uh, Greg Frazier is shooting Dune. Um, ooh, who I don't know who Greg Frazier is. He's he's most he shot Zero Dark Thirty, Rogue One. Okay. Uh, the best looking Star Wars movie. <laughs> All right. Then. I was gonna say Rogue One looks amazing, so I'm fine with that. Um, and he's he's attached to the Batman. So. Ooh. Oh, that movie's gonna look fucking great. Well, the Batman looks great just from the little bit we've seen. So, oh, yeah. that's actually gonna come up in this episode, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, oh yes, because you had <laughs> some great insight into Paul Dando's character in this movie. So I'm <laughs> excited to get to all that. Yeah. But before we do, um, Kobe, you are our guest. So, prisoners, do you remember the first time you saw this movie? <sighs> How was it for you? Did it hold up on the rewatch? I can't remember the last time I watched it. What year did it come out? You said 2013. 2013. So. Even though, you know, you guys know I worked at a AMC or Carmike at the time for mm-hmm. about like a decade. That's so. right. Yeah, you were my plug for getting movie posters for a while. <laughs> hey, man, now I have a plug too. Oh, so. nice. <laughs> so I can't remember if I watched it when it released or not, because mm-hmm. unfortunately my like film appreciation didn't start until um, later on in my like tenure there. Mm-hmm. But I know the first time I watched it, I was like, oh, shit uh i have to watch it again and it's almost <laughs> one of those movies that is better on the second watch yeah because you can you know you can um you can catch all these little bits and pieces that we'll talk about i can see that for sure and really understand it mm-hmm. yeah it's got a different layer to it when you rewatch it and knowing the the truth about some of these characters in it so yeah i i don't remember the first time i saw it either i think i had seen sicario and i was like oh this this movie's fucking dope let me yeah. find out what else this dude has done sicario rules mm-hmm. and then i went back i i went back and watched this one and then arrival and then i didn't see enemy until we did it on the podcast mm-hmm. of course when 2049 came out i was fucking blown away i was like all right i'm in this dude's camp like yeah for good 2049 i saw three times in the theater Ooh, because oh, i was just lucky. like I was like, this is, there's nothing, how is, how am I going to see a better movie this year? It, you know, it's the visual equivalent of like 2001. Like yes. when it came out, it was like, this is revolutionary. I saw it in, uh, yeah, the first time I watched it, I saw it uh, in IMAX and the, 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 I knew I was in for it when the first title hits the screen, uh, you know, in the year 2049, the Terrell mm-hmm. Corporation, blah, blah, blah. And the the bass drop there mm-hmm. just just from words appearing on the screen shook <laughs> the ceiling. Yeah, and I was like I was like, this movie's gonna fucking slap. Yeah, that movie's fucking incredible. Yeah. And actually, there's a little bit of a connection with that movie and this one too that we'll mm-hmm. talk about when we get there. But uh, oh yeah, so let's get in a little more into all of the details surrounding uh, 2013's Prisoners. So the director, as we mentioned, is Denis Villeneuve. Um, The movie stars Jake Jake Gyllenhaal, Hugh Jackman, Paul Dano, Maria Bello, Melissa Leo, Viola Davis, Mm -hmm. and Terrence Howard. You will forget Viola Davis is in this movie until she pops up and you're like, holy shit, the the queen is in this fucking movie. (laughs) There there were a few times like that in this movie. I mean, when when David Dasmalkian walked on screen, Mm -hmm. I I literally I literally texted my buddy David and I was like, now we got a fucking movie. Like (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, man. We'll have to talk about David too, because I got a lot to say about him. But Oh, he's so good. Uh the budget was forty six million dollars, which is you don't see that number that often. No. Like a mid-range movie budget like that. It's so it's such a bygone era now. Mm-hmm. Um but the movie managed to gross 122 million dollars worldwide, 
currently has an 81% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, which I feel like is criminally too low. Yeah. And it is number 192 on IMDb's top 250 movies of all time. Interesting. Okay. Uh, and lastly, Roger Deakins was nominated for an Oscar for Best Cinematography for this movie. Well deserved. I don't know who he lost to, but now... Yeah, that was my question. I, I have to look it up before we watch the trailer, because I gotta know. Yeah. I don't know if you guys know this about me. I avoid trailers at all costs at this point in my life that's right yeah i remember then the trailer that caused this like decision in my life almost like quitting drugs or alcohol <laughs> um, is <laughs> is uh ted 2 Oh god. I think, I think it was Ted too. Oh god. Uh, I was <laughs> like I was so hyped up for it because at that point I was just all about, you know, uh, comedy dick and fart jokes really? movies and shit like that. Sure. So I watched every Red Band trailer, every mm -hmm. Green Band trailer until the movie came out and then I watched the movie I was like, "Oh, it's funny, but I saw everything beforehand." All yep. the jokes. Um, yeah. so I was like, "Nope, not going to watch the trailer." So I've seen <laughs> one trailer, I think since you know over the past couple of years i can remember and it was a batman teaser trailer that came out like uh last year oh yeah and then thankfully when i watch teasers like that they're out of my mind by the time the movie comes out well and the great thing about that teaser is it's like a scene from the movie you know what i mean like yeah. it, it feels like we've barely seen anything yeah i'm glad because at that point it was like what they had only shot like 12 percent of the movie or something right like right and then it got yeah then covid uh held up production yeah you know, I will say I do, I do agree that the 81 percent is is low, but oh boy, I also can see someone feeling like this movie is I mean, this movie is relentlessly dark. Yes. Um, And I can see that turning off some audiences. I thought that I I think it's so compelling, though, and it's so well acted and beautifully shot. The dialogue is great and natural and, and real. So I, I guess I'm also saying like, hey, let's bump those numbers up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I think it is relentlessly dark subject matter, but I don't feel like the movie ever really gets that. I mean, it gets heavy. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Well, they also apparently did trim some stuff, too, to yeah. to, to avoid an NC-17 rating. Oh, oh, I would love to see an NC-17 cut of this movie, I think. You, oh, you found the, yeah. the winner? So Gravity, uh, Emmanuel Lubieski won. Which, oh, um, OK. Uh, that movie looks great. Yeah, sure. I think Prisoners in the long run, it holds up better. I agree. But, you know, Gravity is one of those movies you just, if you don't see it in the theater, it doesn't have nearly the uh, yep. the appeal of it. So anyway, um, yeah, I, I like I said, I would love to see a, an extended version, an NC-17 cut of this movie. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. I got a lot to talk about. Before we do, let's watch the trailer. And yeah. listener, if you're not familiar, this should give you a good idea of what we're talking about with Prisoners. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned. Happy Thanksgiving. Hello. Wait until we're invited. Oh, for God's sake, Kelly, get the hell in here. I love Viola Davis so much. Yep. Uh, what? He actually sings in the shower. So I do not. Yes, you do. <laughs> Can I take Joy to our house? Is this Where like right when Hugh Jackman was Just like deep in Wolverine? Oh, yeah. The, the Wolverine came out this year, I think. Yes. But he looks surprisingly kind of thin yeah am i crazy i feel like this was during chappie well this sure. was when he so his his training for the wolverine was like involved dehydrating himself and shit so like yeah. it's he looks great but he's also not healthy yeah what were you saying kobe something about chappie uh yeah i feel like because of the goatee this was around the time he filmed chappie because uh, he had a goatee good. and chappie yeah, yeah oh and you know what this would have followed filming for les mis mm. where he definitely was uh yeah pretty gaunt and yeah How yeah you find your daughter show me your hands right now huh? you put those girls somewhere Alex no. I know you put those girls somewhere he stays in custody until my daughter's found right we have a 48 hour hold on it ends tomorrow unless we bring charges can charges I tell you something mm. as someone who is in the business of trailer making trouble, these shots that you're blind. seeing of like well, the close up of somebody drawing a maze mm -hmm. that is definitely not from this movie that is definitely they're in some room and it's literally like a one light set up oh yeah it's just some guy yeah we did that for um oh fuck what was the movie called oh the king of staten island oh sure all the uh, credits that are being tattooed on people's arms and stuff that was a uh, that was us doing that Oof. I'm being so quiet because I'm just compelled by the trailer. <laughs> yes. Someone has to make him talk or they're going to die. 
And this this kind of gives away a good amount, but not really. Not really, because we're still in the first 30 minutes of the movie. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I know you know where they are. Where's my daughter? Oof. Chills. It is weird that, um, you know, he's drawing the uh, the legendary pictures logo everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah, Prisoners. Um... Listener, if you're not aware, the movie is essentially about two little girls that go missing mm-hmm. uh, and the two fathers, really just one of the fathers, mm-hmm. trying to f- find his the missing girls and the detective that's been assigned to the case. And that's kind of like the broad strokes of it. Sure. And of course, it, goes, it gets a little more uh, wrapped in layers and goes down deeper and deeper than that. But essentially, we're just talking about a, a thriller where two little girls are missing. So that's your, your uh, internal time clock. Yeah. Is finding these girls. So... Um, before we actually discuss the movie, I think it's only appropriate that we discuss the drink of the movie. Of course. So, Kobe, uh, this is a newer segment to the show where I like to come up with a, a cocktail yes, yes. or something that relates to the movie in a way. I'm also a fan. Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, uh, this one was kind of obvious. Um, there's not a name for it, but basically you just get a, a big pitcher of uh, grape Kool-Aid. And you mix some ketamine in it. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Agreed. Yes. You only drink about a third of it, though. Right. Because, you know, for a man my size, I only need about a third of it. That's right. If you're a bitch. <laughs> do you know who... Did, did you see who originally was attached to this movie? Because I before did. it was Villeneuve... There was actually a couple of different actors yeah. attached to it. Uh, you want to run down the list? Uh, Christian Bale and Leonardo DiCaprio were attached for a while. Yeah. Um, uh, with directors Antoine Fuqua and Brian Singer. Nope. And at one point, Mark Wahlberg was attached to yep. stars as well no thank you yeah like all of those sound like i mean maybe fuqua with christian bale but like i uh i don't know like i it, feel like I, the best you're getting out of that is something like uh out of the furnace yeah you know what i mean well, i mean mark Wahlberg already kind of did this movie anyway with lovely bones that's true <laughs> yeah. yeah and i'm not really i like i into on fuqua movies but there's also no there's no subtext to anything he really does like there's no that's true other layers it's all kind of surface and it would have just been like this would have been more like a john wick kind of thing yeah. of like yeah, i don't want to see that i no. i like this movie because hugh jackman unbeknownst to himself and un, un, apparently unbeknownst to a lot of film critics uh he's the villain of the movie oh yeah and a lot of Critics don't seem to get that because I was reading before we started recording a, a review of this movie and it was like, here's the I'm not going to call out the the uh, editorial, but it sure. was basically like, here's the five big problems with prisoners. And I'm reading through it. And I'm like, this article doesn't get that Hugh Jackman is not the hero of the movie. And no, he is almost certainly <laughs> the antagonist, like, yeah, more so than um, Melissa Leo. I mean, I guess they're both about equal, really. Yeah, well, it, it, it's, it, you know, Keller throughout the film just keeps making things worse yes you know what i mean yeah. like the, all he would you know he's he's just he's making things worse for his family he's making things more difficult for loki's investigation mm-hmm. i mean to the point where like you know jumping ahead but when he figures out what's going on he just runs out the door instead of telling the police that are there who can help him <laughs> yeah he tries to go cover up what he's done. Like he try, yeah, he's he goes full vigilante and like just keeps digging himself deeper. But it's it's hard because at the start of this movie, I feel like you're kind of on Hugh Jackman's side. Like you're you're oh, in yeah. for what he is until I would say probably until he kidnaps Alex. Yeah, he's got the and even then it's you're kind of with him for a minute. Yes. And but like, yeah, you're introduced to Hugh Jackman with a good old boy haircut. Mm-hmm. He's having trouble with money. Mm-hmm. He's stuck in this holding pattern. He sings the Star Spangled Banner in the shower oh. and says the Lord's Prayer while before he kills a deer. Like he's he's set up to be, you know, this sweet as apple pie, all American dad. Yeah. No, it's. I don't think I've ever seen a movie that start off as quietly as this one. Yeah. It's like there's no fanfare over the production cards. The title just kind of fades up and then fades out. Mm -hmm. It fades up and there's literally just a deer grazing. It's like a No Country for Old Man kind of opening. Like it's very quiet. I'd say the ending is like that too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The movie just kind of just fades up. A lot of shit happens and we fade out. Yeah. It's it's a it's a slice we spend a uh, we spend a, a week of the wor- the worst week of detective loki's life with him. yes yeah yeah 
you know, I, I love the metaphor that this opening scene with Hugh Jackman and his son is setting up because it's like mm -hmm. he is fully prepared as we come to see with his doomsday prepping stuff. Like yeah. he's fully prepared for everything, every possible scenario, except except for this a man made threat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like He's prepared for hurricanes. He's prepared for radiate radioactive fallouts or whatever. But when it comes to something as simple as his kid going missing, he he collapses under the weight of. Yeah. Of everything. Yeah. I also want to note that. People like to say that there aren't enough Thanksgiving movies, so boom, here's one, because this movie takes place. Yeah. They go missing on Thanksgiving Day. <laughs> so. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't imagine, man. Like, it, I'm kind of glad that this movie defeats the, um, it's not really a stereotype, but it is kind of something that people say, like, mm. once they become children, their whole attitude towards children in movies and in TV shows, like, completely changes. Oh, like, once they have kids? Yeah, they even made fun of that on uh, on Family Guy, I think, mm -hmm. once. It was just like, oh, until you have a kid, you couldn't possibly understand. I'm like, that's horseshit. I saw this movie before I was a dad, and I've watched it now after I'm a dad, and I gotta say, I still feel the exact same way. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, 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 there's so many stomach drop moments in this yes. movie, and I I've written down a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah, the, the first one for me, I mean, more so than just when the kids first go missing is Paul Dano saying they didn't stop crying until I left them. Yeah. Or didn't start crying. Yeah, I was like, oh. Yeah. It's, and especially because you don't know anything about Alex's character at that moment. And you're just like, this dude's clearly in on it. Mm -hmm. You know, the movie does great bait and switch with that. I yeah. Think. Yeah. For me, it was uh, cutting to Detective Loki for the first time. And he's like flirting with the waitress mm -hmm. <laughs> by reading the sign. I'm kidding. <laughs> it didn't actually make my stomach drop. <laughs> but I, I was just what a weird introduction for this character. I love it, though, because it's yeah. like, of course, he would be at, a, at an Asian restaurant on Thanksgiving because th that's what people do when they don't have families yeah right? they just go out to eat and nothing's really open except for <laughs> right that's you know, true. chinese places and stuff like that yeah i also appreciate the the balls of just like giving a character the name loki i was gonna ask it like, was a turnoff at first he's a variant man yeah but what, what is the significance of that because he's not mischie mischievous no but when yeah that was the thing was like when they when his name was revealed as detective loki i was waiting for about half the movie for the the turn where it turned out he was actually manipulating it all from you know mm, yeah, yeah. i don't know if that's meant to make us not trust him at first and and kind of keep us on keller's side i don't know it's a it's a it's a weird choice and he's also got those like no, like those norse tattoos on his fingers and yes gyllenhaal looks great in this movie i gotta tell you though I, I i fucking love his name i love the character detective loki that's such a cool name yeah there's a there's a whole lot of like religious undertones throughout this sure. whole film you know sure so um i mean even with uh like you were saying with Keller, you know, always praying before he does anything bad as mm -hmm. far as like hurting um, Paul Dano or killing the deer or doing this or doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He prays. And then the goal of um, uh, the, uh, the old lady, I can't remember. Her name. The Joneses. Yeah. Like she's like, I don't want you to believe in anything. Yeah. Religion's fate. It's a war against God. And she, she was coming from someone who was super religious, she says. Like right. her and her husband were were deeply religious. And in there, because their son died of cancer, that's when they decided to start abducting kids, which I guess I'm, I'm kind of glad they don't go too deep into like why they're doing all of this. The stuff. motivations. Yes. Yeah. I'm kind of glad that they don't because I don't think you could have justified it with that character. But no, I, I I agree with you, Nathan. I think Jake Gyllenhaal looks fucking incredible in this movie. Like, <laughs> I think I I texted you last night. I was like, he is devastatingly handsome in this film. Yeah, like he looks so cool. <laughs> it's so crushing. Like his haircut on his frame Holy and his shit. jawline. Yeah. Holy fuck! I I want to fuck Jake Gyllenhaal so bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's wild because he he spends so much of the movie with the you know the slicked back hair, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, standing straight up, very controlled, very measured. Mm -hmm. And then when the when the switch happens and he's got his hair in his face and he's screaming mm -hmm. and breaking shit, I'm just like, oh my god! Yeah, like it it really does. He he his whole physicality changes. His performance is so good. Well, my my favorite one of my favorite shots of all of cinema is in this movie. Mm -hmm. And it's when he's after um, David has blown his brains out in the in the interrogation room. <laughs> right. And he's in the, the captain's office and he's just staring at the at the maze on the floor. Yeah. And it's just the simplest shot of just like mm -hmm. the top down view of him running his fingers through his hair. And like you get everything that his character is going through in that moment that he's completely lost control. Mm -hmm. He has no idea what his next lead is. Like there's there's nothing worse for a detective 
than when a case goes cold or like you run out of options like you have no leads and we've seen him also tell his boss like to fuck off you know don't don't screw me on this the whole time yeah he's in control i love that scene and then this is when he goes i'm sorry yeah (laughs) it's it's crushing yeah it's a it's so good the chief is yeah basically like what do you want me to do i can't do that you you know i can't like the whole movie Mm -hmm. and it's um, I don't want to say the chief is right, but right. yeah, when David blows his brains out, he's kind of like, well, I fucking told you, man. Like, it's your fault. <laughs> yeah. You have to think this is like the first defeat in his career, too. Yes. Yeah. Then they say this was like he was 100 percent completion rate and like, you know, finding out, mm-hmm. you know, the people and finding the kids and all this stuff. Yeah. So because he's so dedicated to, you know, being the best around, I'm surprised yeah. he looks as healthy as he does. I expected him to be all scruffy and out of shape and just you know almost toxic like and what's interesting is that he he plays loki at points like he's on autopilot Mm -hmm. and i mean that as a good like as a as a positive for his performance Mm -hmm. like he he just switches tactics when one thing's not working i mean when he's interrogating paul dano Mm -hmm. Uh, there's the bit where he's 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 like where where the fuck do you take the kids like where are they just tell me where they are and then he switches to i know you're a good guy mm-hmm. like he changed each and then it's the same thing when when keller he's bad cop and good cop like at the, at same, the same time, time. <laughs> and when when keller comes in to like yell at him and he he has that whole thing of like we're considering all possibilities i hear what you're saying mm-hmm. and those two lines come back over and over again because that is his training that is how he has always gotten the job done yeah and it is driving him fucking crazy that it's not working this time but i i love that the most we get out of him breaking is when he like destroys the keyboard and throws yes. the computer and everything it, mm-hmm. he doesn't have to like as extreme as like his character in nightcrawler where he's breaking the the mirror and everything yeah. like there, there's never that there's one moment in the movie where he's like unmeasured really yes. and it's that moment so yeah. it's like you know this and you know there's kind of like a brief kind of mention that he was uh he grew up in like a, a foster home for yeah. boys and like you know and might have been mistreated exactly so like and this whole movie's about that it's yeah. all about people all uh specifically little boys that were mistreated because like you find out that alex was kidnapped at a young age you find out david was and managed to escape you find out that heller's dad blew his brains out and didn't even leave a suicide note right like you find out so much about all these male characters and it's i mean this is a phrase that gets tossed around a lot but i feel like the toxic masculinity in this movie yeah outside a lot of other movies that try to yes take on the same kind of message because it's all hugh jackman's character is it's just vengeful rage yeah targeted in one direction and you don't know it's in refusing to waver yes yeah. like he, he even when you know loki is telling him like look man i interrogated, interrogated this guy for 10 hours you know a lie detector only uh works if they understand the questions we right. can't really hold them legally hugh jackman's like no i don't i don't buy any of that he and tells him shut the fuck up he screams at this detective and his wife jumps and then he just he, he goes i'm i'm sorry please listen to me yes you know and, and then he runs up to him in the car and you can hear loki go oh shit fuck me <laughs> <laughs> this is this is hugh jackman's best performance thank right thank you thank you i was gonna say the same thing he's excellent he's so He's so good. I know people are going to say probably Logan or something like that, or maybe great even Prestige, but nope, nope, this is it. This is his best performance. I would say that I would say the Prestige is definitely up there, but like this is there is a there is a a a, a control to this performance that is surprising, mm-hmm. you know, because it, it on the page I feel like Keller is asked to be a. A, a, you know, like a, a rage, like a ball of rage constantly. But mm-hmm. but Hugh Jackman finds different levels and different ways of measuring it yeah. and containing it. And like you said, pointing it in a direction um, there. There's I don't know. There's there's just something very I think it's a lot more nuanced than some of the critics have given it credit for. Absolutely. Because like when he's <laughs> I got to say to um, the the one actor in this movie that has the balls to <laughs> Dylan Minetti, the, the son, yes, it, yeah, it has the biggest balls out of anyone in this movie because when he tries to stand up to Hugh Jackman, yeah, I can smell it on your fucking breath. <laughs> yeah, I'm fucking terrified of this dude. And then he slams against the wall. I'm like, this is the same rage that he has um, when he's interrogating Alex. Yeah, but for some reason, it's done with a sense of of fear yes. and not anger yeah you know what i mean like yes it's the same performance but you get that extra subtle little subtext layer there that like he loves his son and he he's doing this out of 
because he's scared. But it, and it's also just like his wife has disintegrated. Yes. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he needs he need I need you to not fuck this up for me is what that that line says. You know what I mean? Like that is that's essentially what he's doing. He tells her don't let her watch the news. I'm mm-hmm. like I don't think you could keep a mom with a missing kid away from watching the news. No. Like that's that's a level as much as him keeping Alex a secret from the rest of the world. Like, and that's the thing is at first I the one the one criticism I think I would level at this movie of at least for the first half is I felt like Grace Grace kind of becomes a non character for a lot of it. Mm-hmm. But I also think that the movie ends up justifying that by showing how much the fact that she has like retreated from the world and she just wants to sleep is uh, not only like wrecking the family, but it's also pushing Keller even further into thinking that this is what he has to do. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't know. There's there's so many there's so many different layers going on with every single performance. Yeah. When when he comes in and she's crying on the bed and she's like, oh, she's been gone for three days. Yeah. Just bring her home. And he goes to hug her and she pushes him away. I'm like, why can't you make her come home? I know. Dude, I, my fucking heart breaks and I can't, I can't feel any. Yeah worse for 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 keller until that moment and then of course he fucks it up and you know your your, um your admiration and your champion of him just disintegrates as the whole movie goes on and like especially on the second time seeing this movie knowing that alex has this diminished uh intelligence and that he was abused someone on reddit pointed out something that i thought was incredible that i never really thought about but they basically pointed out that essentially what Hugh Jackman's doing this movie is the equivalent of torturing his own daughter. Yes. Because Alex was kidnapped mm-hmm. as a kid and now has this uh, mental uh, disability. Possibly from all the drugs over the years. Yeah, they said he had like a LSD ketamine cocktail yeah. for years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's he's essentially torturing this this guy to gain information that he doesn't have, really. Right. I mean... He can barely string a sentence together. He has some information, yeah. obviously. Well, he's got information, but not information he can access. Yeah. The movie does a really good job of making you think that he's putting it on at the beginning. Yes. yes. Like when he's signing his name to get out of the... to be released from the the penitentiary. Yeah. And um, when, he, when Loki goes to interview him and he's kind of like staring up at the ceiling like, um, I don't know. Like, that's... It's such a good twist on I it. I will say... The moment when he picks up the dog, yeah, mm-hmm. I is I've been thinking about that. It's unforgivable. It, well, yeah, and I I don't know if that's just him letting out this this extra anger that he doesn't understand. You know, but Ooh, like it's, that's interesting. It's such a I didn't even think about it that way. It's such a strange moment because he I don't know he like holds the dog for a minute and it's almost played like he might have seen uh, Keller in the car. I, I don't know. There's just. There's some strange moments here that 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 really make you wonder, you know, how much how much Alex understands what's happening around him. You know what I mean? And if and if he's trying to get back at at the Joneses, but he doesn't know exactly where to place that fury. I almost feel like Alex is fucking with Keller mentally. Mm. Interesting. Before um, Keller starts mess, you know, with like torturing him yeah. physically, because yeah. obviously he you know he's the one that took the girls to begin with right right well sort of and then you know takes them home and everything he he knows he knows something sure i think the truth is that the kids did come back to play on the rv he mm-hmm. offered to give him a ride yes see that's interesting you guys took it that way i took alex's character to be completely devoid of any cognitive um thought process well and i i feel like that's that is the case for most of the movie the the one thing that keeps bringing me back to it is him picking up the dog it's just such a strange do you think it's just that he doesn't know that that's bad yes that's okay truly because they say he's got the iq of a 10 year old and i think it's even worse than that i think he is it's just so far gone on on this this horrible mix of of ketamine and shit they've been giving him that right i don't think he understands right from wrong i don't think he understands understands like the severity of like when he gets uh when he's in the interrogation room i really don't think he understands why he's there yeah. it's like um it's like the brother in good time almost but worse you know oh sure that's how i took i, I took sense. him picking up the dog as he doesn't know that that's a bad thing to do that that hurts i okay. don't think he's doing that maliciously i think he's just doing it to do it you know what i mean interesting but i could be wrong that's just how i also since we're talking about that scene i can ask nathan mm-hmm. would you Consider that to be a little bit of 
scampish behavior him picking up the dog i you know i i was trying to find the scamp of the film and i couldn't i could not fucking do it i would i was uh-huh. almost leaning towards uh bob taylor until he yeah, shot yeah, himself yeah. Um, sure. wait what there, this has been the season of scamps kobe is this a new segment i'm uh, i'm unaware of so, so kobe somehow we've picked up on this throughout the season that every episode we've done just about has a character that's a little bit of a little devil, a little scam. There's a little stinker. A little mischievous, a little, uh, like, uh, it was the Red Queen of Resident Evil. It was Ooh. Prince and Under the Cherry Moon, you know? I will say, <laughs> um, I think it, at least for the first half of the movie, it might be Detective Loki. <laughs> is that because his name is Loki? <laughs> well, that, but also, I love the moment when he, like, he walks in. I, he does all these, like, uh, he, like, rounds up all these suspects. He's questioning them in silhouette, which I think is a really interesting choice. Yeah. And then... He goes into the the the, the pastor's home mm-hmm. and dude's passed out drunk on the floor. That dude was hammered. And he, <laughs> which by the way, I wrote the. I'm sad Mally's not here because like he walks into the kitchen. Loki walks into the kitchen. There's an open can of beans and a half bottle of whiskey. And I wrote down, <laughs> "This is how Mally lives." <laughs> it probably is how Mally. Like lives. I just imagined that. Um, and then he but, just passes out face down on the floor every night. <laughs> right, and mo- forgets to move his fridge back. How how did Loki know? How did Loki know he was sleeping so quick? He yeah. he came into the room so quick and then was like, oh, okay, he's sleeping. I can hear him snoring from 10 but, feet yeah. away. Yeah, I was going to say, the su- the subtitle said snoring, I think, was the way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but he also does, but he has that bit where he goes like, he kicks him and he's like, you don't mind if I have a look around, do you? Yeah, that is a little bit of a scam. And I was like, oh, he's he's a little he's bit a of little a scam. He's a little bit of a scam. Well, he's yeah. a sex offender too, right? The The... The priest? Yeah. It's the implication. Yeah, because he goes to that one guy's office and tosses around the German porn that he has. He talks to the one guy in the restaurant. Yeah. Yep. It is weird that it's like, oh, this priest who seems like a nice guy. I mean, I guess that's kind of the point of what the movie's trying to say. But but he's also been reassigned yes. because the murder happened because he... Which, by the way, this priest was the original Sweeney Todd on, what? on Broadway. What? <laughs> yeah, like he won he won a Tony Award for Best Actor. Like I, I was like, why do I know this guy? I mean, he's he's good in a little bit of the movie he's in. He's very good. Yeah, yeah. huge huge theater actor. Because I took it as like you know, obviously with children being abducted and stuff, and um, I. I I think this was after they released alex right that he went to the pre house um or was it somewhere around uh, it's, there it's during the hold it's like during the 20 like the the 24 yeah, hour hold yeah. i believe oh, okay. but yeah he... i took it as like him finding another lead just in case alex doesn't work out so he's like you know going down a list of like yeah. child sex offenders and then he happens to stumble across the murder and everything yeah that's what he says he says i'm gonna go i'm gonna round up the usual folks or something like that and yeah, then... he says i've got three uh, high level sexual offenders in the area or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But man, talk about luck though, because that the body in the priest's basement yeah. just happening to have the maze, like, oof, talk about super luck on this case. There are a couple of moments in this movie where like it's so funny because I just we, we just recorded an episode on uh, John Carpenter's Halloween for uh, for, the, for Oh That's a Scary Movie mm-hmm. and I was thought I was thinking about the fact that like there's like three times in that movie where Doctor Loomis finds very important information by looking to the left <laughs> <laughs> like he just kind of looks over and there's like the mechanics truck yeah. or the or the or the car from the asylum and that happens with Loki a couple times in this movie where it's just like oh thank God he looked like down and to the right yeah but uh. But you know what? It's fine. It's 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 a detective movie. I'll take it. Like yeah. I, I still think it's Is that good. I still think it's yeah, and it's so fucking compelling that I don't even I don't even mind. Yeah, Jake Gyllenhaal plays so good at being slightly freaked out by stuff because yeah. when he falls down in the basement, and he sees the statue. He goes, "Oh fuck!" fuck. And then he does that again with the snakes later on. <laughs> <laughs> the facial ticks isn't it are, are an interesting yeah. choice. I never really noticed it before, but the, the twitches and eye. Oh, it's a very blinky performance. And yeah, it, it comes out the most when he's being being challenged yes. like you can see him um you can see him th- uh, thinking like he like when he's looking at like evidence he blinks a lot and when he's getting yelled at he blinks a lot because you can mm-hmm. and when he's interrogating alex too he blinks a lot and i think that comes from growing up in a, an abusive environment probably like it's almost like he's wincing his way through it mm-hmm. to like not not flinch i agree fully um it's such an interesting performance it's subtle things that Jalen hall does yeah like in uh that movie nightcrawler demolition anime like yeah that you just no one else can do it better i feel like than him Fuck, nightcrawler rules <laughs> he is genuinely one of the best actors working today I like agree. i don't understand like i actually saw an article today i think it was like why does jay Hall not get 
spoken in the same breath of respect as like a Leonardo or a Christian Bale or something sure. like that. And I don't, I don't know why, I, because this dude turns in performance after performance and he gives it his fucking all. Yeah. Loki is a great fucking character because it's Gyllenhaal doing it. I don't think anyone else could really embody that. Yeah. The other actor that almost had this role, I believe, was Ryan Gosling, yes. which I think would have been close to this. But like th this is the perfect marriage of actor and role. Yeah. Ryan Gosling doesn't have the vulnerability that mm -hmm. something, someone like Jane Gyllenhaal does. Like Ryan Gosling is always kind of stoic. Yeah. In his performance. Which is why he's perfect for Kay in Blade Runner 2049. <laughs> yeah. Yes, or or um, the kid in Drive, or yeah. like something like that. But oh, Drive! Oh my God! Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and sorry. <laughs> yeah, the only reason he didn't get this role is because they had just done Enemy, and Villeneuve was like, "I kind of want to work with Jake Gyllenhaal again." I get it. Yeah, yeah, I, I get it too. I would not want to. I would not want to work with anybody <laughs> That's else. My guy. I got. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Speaking of um, Villeneuve, though, yeah. um I think one of the things that separates him from a lot of other directors, and like I said, why I think he's the best working today is mm -hmm. he is so good at luring you in with the mundane uh -huh. because like this movie's two and a half hours long and i don't feel that runtime no. and even like the first 10 minutes of this movie nothing of any real significant happens right. like it's just them walking across the street getting ready for thanksgiving and it's like i'm fully engaged i'm like leaning in to learn everything about these people because mm -hmm. there's some something he does with his performances and of course being paired with roger deakins it's like mm -hmm. it's so mesmerizing just Watching these, watching Terrence Howard badly play the Star Spangled Banner on a trumpet is engaging. Right. <laughs> You're also getting these really interesting, like very subtle character beats. Mm -hmm. I mean, like there's the stuff with Jackman, like he's the kind of guy who will sing the Star Spangled Banner in the shower. Mm -hmm. But also you get like uh, Terrence Howard's, uh, their whole family is kind of like weirded out by the by the idea of hunting which yeah. i think i think kind of well they're vegetarians oh that's right yeah that's right yeah, yeah. it's just uh it's an interesting i don't know it's an interesting wrinkle to the, and i will say terrence howard didn't click for me really until the scene where he sees paul dano in the in the apartment building that's fair i think that's supposed to i think he's supposed to be a much more I think so too yeah well because jackman's playing the assertive person it's the bad cop good cop yes <laughs> terrence howard's the good cop and it's not until kelly <laughs> says maybe my favorite line in the movie he's not a person anymore Oof. that that howard kind of like turned he ne he's never fully on board with it but you can see that he's desperate and that's why he's there well i mean when when you get the wonder of Hugh Jackman with the hammer. Oh my God! Threatening to break his hand. You can see Terrence Howard. Yeah. Just as terrified as as Alex is. I got sick to my stomach when yes. he pulled the hammer out. Yes. Yeah. And and when he started breaking this thing. And Paul Dano doesn't break a fucking sweat mm -mm. in this movie, and especially in that scene. Mm -mm. He's got to be him and David Desmond has got to be like two of the most underrated character actors of all time yes yeah. jesus fucking christ they crush it in everything they do yeah i mean paul dano and there will be blood and swiss army man so are great. incredible performance he's great in uh ruby sparks mm -hmm. too like that like he's he's good in any genre <laughs> i mean his directorial debut was pretty good yeah um uh what was it called wildlife was that what it's called with jake Something. Hall, actually yes yeah uh, pretty good and then yeah david has made a career off of being the quote-unquote creepy guy like <laughs> yeah. like for real like the dark knight this movie and i think the dark knight was the first thing i remember me seeing too. him in me too yeah and he, he's great in the suicide squad <laughs> oh man I... look D david dasmalkian is running the game on the multiverse this year yeah. i mean he is he's in the suicide squad he plays calendar man in the animated batman the long halloween and he's great in that um he just popped up on what if you know like an episode ago mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I fucking love David Dasmalkian. He's great in his, like, two scenes in Blade Runner 2049. I agreed. On this rewatch, too, because I had forgotten the, the reveal about his character, I think he's doing something so fucking incredibly hard, mm -hmm. which is... He's got to play this double edge of being this deeply unsettling and disturbed threat. Like, when he's creeping through their homes and everything. Right. And when Loki first goes to his house to see him, mm -hmm. which also got a good laugh out of me because Loki... Uh because David opens the door and Jake Gyllenhaal is just smiling and just says, good morning. And they just sit there uncomfortably for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right. I got a great laugh out of that. But then he also has to play this victim of abuse and kidnapping himself. Mm -hmm. And I think he does it so effortlessly. Like 
he walks that line because so, he never gives it away. He never gives away. That. I want to rewatch those scenes because yeah. I really want to rewatch the movie because it's like on first viewing, he's so sinister. And now I wonder if I watch it again, am I just going to be like, oh, he's a scared kid mm -hmm. you know what i mean like he's confused that's alex too that's every yes. yes that's everyone like that's his alex like loki and david are the same as as uh as heller and alex and i know i'm going back and forth between actor and character names right. but yeah me too well i think i think what's the the interesting thing about keller is that he's also scared yes. like he there's a moment where he asks um he asks like why won't you fucking tell us like why won't you just like he's he's so upset that he's doing what he's doing mm -hmm. until he's fine with it like there's a there's a bit where it just feels like a routine has set in like yeah. i get up at 6 a.m i i drive over there and i reluctantly torture this kid for 12 hours a day i pour scalding hot water on a kid that's in pitch blackness and he says barely has enough room to even sit down yeah and I've beaten him so bad that his eyes have swollen shut that like when Viola Davis comes to finally see him. Oh my God. When she sees him. Yes. I don't know how this movie wasn't nominated for more Oscars. Like, yeah, the makeup effects in this movie are. It's an, it, the makeup's <sighs> incredible. Her reaction is so believable. The look that he he Dano's so good at acting through that makeup mm -hmm. the the slight glance to the side that he gives when he hears Hugh Jackman fire up the table saw yeah is chilling yes and then like it's also almost unintentionally like I got an uncomfortable chuckle out of it yeah. because Viola Davis shows Paul Dano the photo of her daughter yeah and she's like do you see her? And it's like, these two can't see shit. Right. There's no way you right. can see anything. That's what exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. It looks yeah. like he went 10 rounds with Rocky. Yeah. I, <laughs> it's like, you see him? I can't I see was shit. Getting, <laughs> there are a couple of like upsetting laughs in this movie. Like mm -hmm. the, the, the full like five minutes of Loki busting open each of the totes and yes. finding more, more snakes, snakes and just <laughs> oh, and he fuck. just keeps going. Oh, fuck. Fuck. <laughs> oh, fuck. Yeah. I don't get the snakes. I don't. I mean, I, I, get it in terms of the why the group did it but it's like yeah i don't know i mean speaking of of stomach draughts when loki burst in and sees all those cases yes i mean you don't know what's in them the first time but oh my god you're like yeah and then when he the first one he opens there's just bloody kids clothes you're like jesus fucking yeah. christ yeah and it, yeah i i was fully just i was like can, i i had this moment where i was like we still have an hour yeah we still have an hour and like 10 minutes of this movie there's no way they caught the killer but then also like I don't know. It's so interesting. Like the more they dig into the character and the fact that he's kind of like just reenacting, you know, I, I did it from watching you essentially like that. Well, yeah. And it's, it's never really made clear either. Cause yeah. like when the last like 15 minutes or so, when Loki goes and he's talking to the other detective, he's like, Oh, we found this book. It was mostly de yeah. discredited. And he's like, are you, he made all these mazes like in this book and everything. Mm -hmm. And when you see the cover of his book too, and it says, you can, once you do all the mazes, you can go home. Mm -hmm. and, and then him saying, oh, this last one's, you can't, you can't beat it. It's unfinishable. It's like, Jesus, fuck. Man. Yeah. There's Ugh. a lot of weird stuff. That scene is kind of odd. Like the, when he's talking to um, the, the CSI dude at the, at the crime scene. Yeah. Like, and, it, and it's just rich, I think is his name. Uh, yes. Yeah. Who, his performance is unbelievable. Like his line when he says, he killed himself last night he goes wow oh, man i thought he was in custody yeah. like the, the delivery yeah. of that is incredible <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff that's kind of like i feel like i, I wish we, you know there's so much that we see and like sit with in this movie that it's odd that we kind of get um you know we we get bob's uh backstory in a like an, an aside almost mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. um there's just a couple of odd that that the dialogue in that scene is kind of in kind of odd in how detached it is yeah well as far as like bob's character goes i i took it as like he was also abducted by these people right as a child and then he becomes so obsessed with constructing these mazes and yeah. being that kind of killer is what and that's why he broke in all these um people's homes and stole the kids that were abducted right their clothes and then put the blood on it and it is all about imitation yes and um it just obsession but again i i don't think it's done with a malicious intent oh no i agree oh yeah yeah he's processing in the weirdest way exactly yeah. that's that's his way of grieving like being obsessed with this book that he is convinced is based on the people that stole him yeah and you know going to this department store buying these kids clothes pouring pig's blood on them like yeah that's his 
therapy essentially because yes. it almost gets into like joker territory it's like s- social programs don't really sure. help all that well for people like this like right. what do you do with someone like paul dano that's got the iq of a 10 year old that's been missing from his family for 26 years that's been drinking ketamine kool-aid for years well yeah i mean when we learn that he you know uh skipping ahead a little bit but when we learn that he's been reunited with his family Mm -hmm. what is his fucking life you know what i mean like that's he's not the movie doesn't concern itself with it it's just like yeah he's back keep going he's in the system you know i i it's and there's this interesting thing like you you keep mentioning you know people acting with not without malicious intent Mm -hmm. and there's there's a grayness to I think every character except Holly Jones yeah. um, and, and Keller most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is this interesting thing where like when when he pretends to have passed out drunk so that uh, yep. so that Loki won't like keep looking. Mm-hmm. I, I wrote down, I don't know if I want if I want Keller to attack Loki, if I want to hear Alex call for help. Yeah. If I want Loki to question Keller about harder about why he's here. Yeah. Like, I, I literally was just like, I don't know what's right here. But the tension is still so apparent. Yes. In that scene. And yeah. a lot of that comes from just this. Th- there is a feeling of unease and completely uneven ground mm-hmm. throughout the whole movie. Well, I feel like a lesser movie, too, would like play that scene up to like it just like uh, Hugh Jackman's eyes would keep darting back towards yeah. the bathroom. And, right. you know, it, but, as he's walking closer and then the phone rings. Yeah. You know? But no, I mean, he literally just walks. They throw away that shot of of Jake Gyllenhaal just walking past it mm-hmm. like it's nothing important. Yep. And also, I, I wrote down. I thought you'd appreciate this, uh, Nathan. I wrote down <laughs> Deus Ex Death Mountain because like <laughs> the only reason he doesn't get caught right there is because the girl sees him drive. Uh, David driving away in the car. Right. I just thought that was funny. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there's so much else to talk about too. Like when when he's t- when Loki's tailing uh, Hugh Jackman and he's clearly about to walk over to the house. Yeah, and then the garbage truck pulling up. I got so fucking mad when I saw how much room that truck had to go around. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but then like the evil fucking look that Hugh Jackman gives, like knowing that it's Loki yes. across the street. Yeah. And then he's able to walk in, get the liquor, walk. I thought he was going to smash the bottle on his head. Like I was I was like, I don't know what this man is capable of. Exactly. Now. And then for Loki to then as as this guy is drinking an open container of, of alcohol in his passenger seat. And Loki says, there's a bag of lye in your basement that's half empty. Yo. He's like, dude, like this. He just drops the act. <laughs> they go toe to toe this whole movie. And yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. And I do like that they subvert what you would think would happen with this, with Hugh Jackman's character, that he couldn't be that measured in that moment. And then he has, he's good at coming up with lies. Like, he's like, well, why do you yeah. stay out so late? Oh, I go to my old house and drink there because I don't want my wife to see me drunk. Yeah. It's like, I believe th- that he believes that yeah and he also says like uh what's the line he says like i i want ah oh, fuck what is it um why are you what your wife says you've been out helping us look what have you actually been doing he's like mm-hmm. i've been driving around because i don't know what the fuck to do yeah you know yeah and and, and on the other hand you've got um you've got terrence howard uh who like franklin is being led by everyone the whole movie like he genuinely yeah, franklin has no agency in this whole movie i mean from the point yeah he's he's helping torture and then he's convinced to you know walk away and not tell the police and yeah it from 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 moment to moment it feels like he's he has no idea what to do he's so lost well i almost think he wanted to get caught yeah oh, yeah i could see that as soon as he got caught by his wife mm-hmm. he dropped the he was like oh this is what's happening yeah and then he just stood back whenever she confronted keller was like Hey, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> I love Viola Davis showing up at his door. She's like, what'd you do? Yeah. And you see Franklin in the background kind of like his head down, like staring at his shoes. Like he's, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. But no, like, I, I feel like if I was Terrence Howard, uh, uh, Terrence Howard's character, I'd be so fucking angry. Yeah. When Hugh Jackman brings me back to the house and shows me Alex there duct taped and tied up. I'd be like, dude, what the fuck have you got me into? Yeah. And then for joy to be the one that escapes i felt like was deserving like i agree their family while complicit in what hugh jackman was doing never went to those extremes like you never see them talking to loki until loki shows him the photos from david's house but it also looks like it drives him fucking crazy because he's like after i've done all of this to the person that i'm sure kidnapped her 
and I'm not the one who gets my kid back. Like there's exactly there is a there's a there's a selfishness to his performance, too, because the, he immediately starts questioning the this child who is in a coma immediately. Yeah. And oh, by the way, the scene where where Loki's showing them the the photos, I think this might be the unsung best per, like moment in Jackman's performance. Mm-hmm. And it's not when he breaks down crying. Mm-hmm. It's first he won't stand up when he says, you know, do you want to come in here? Where's your wife? He won't stand up. Then he finally stands up. He's kind of taking forever to answer questions. And then when he gets to the room where the photos are, he won't cross the threshold. Like he is so afraid of having tortured this person for no reason and to have found out that his daughter is dead, that he's prolonging even stepping into the room with mm-hmm. every single choice he makes it's a it's an incredible performance and, and then once he finally does recognize that one of the socks is his daughters he immediately says this is your fault yes you were taking too long you were chasing me down and there's still no bodies yeah by the way like he still doesn't know for sure that his daughter is dead it's also the only time loki doesn't defend himself yeah to to, to keller at least mm-hmm. he's just he just because what do you say to a man who thinks he just he's lost his child you know yeah like i fucking tried like you know no he's not gonna do that and and there's so so many photographs of just bloody like Oof. the stack of photos photos that he yeah. has it's and he just goes through one after another oh, and to know like how you don't even know how many photos viola davis had to go through to get to yeah to jesus no man I, I every again i think this is this is movie is like the perfect example why we should retroactively give awards to movies <laughs> like <laughs> right this movie definitely deserves at least an oscar for makeup an an Oscar for acting. I mean, just put like the, the clip of the hammer scene yeah. is enough to get Hugh Jackman. That should be the clip they play at the award ceremony. Yeah. Like this is, you know, they always pick a clip from the movies that they're nominated for. Right. That would be it. Like Jesus fucking Christ, dude! Well, was he even nominated for like no. best actor? That no, year? no, that's a shame. There were no acting nods for this movie. The only nomination this movie got was for 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 uh, cinematography. Yeah, insane. Which it looks incredible. There is not a single shot wasted in this movie. It does look incredible. There's a shot where they just push in on a tree. Yeah, it's towards the beginning. It's right when the kids go missing. But like, it's the it's the Heller's house in the background, and then it's just like the tree it's mm-hmm. I, and it's still it's so fucking engaging i don't i don't understand how deacons does it but yeah. god damn i mean the and the the visuals and the music work together so well the 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 escape sequence when we see uh w- when we see joy escaping and the mm-hmm. the music cue the, the 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 just that oh my god it's harrowing i mean it, it genuinely like made it was another moment that my stomach dropped when the music kicks in and it cuts to the sort of you know hazy pov shot Mm -hmm. uh just oh my god it's off it's it's terrifying but then that's right when the little actress playing well i don't want to say little actress that's unsubminative the actress playing joy yeah this kid gives a performance that she's incredible breaks your fucking heart like yeah when she looks at hugh jackman and starts crying and says you were there yeah oh man it's fucking your your stomach just drops <laughs> i mean the days that she gets she's in when she's stumbling through the street that that whole sequence is is so tense as well and she almost gets hit by a car yeah. until someone grabs her oh and there there's not a single bad performance in this movie like no, even I agree. as little as she's in uh what's her name maria bello like the the mom crushes it yeah, oh she's unbelievable viola yeah. davis viola davis is in this movie and she's in the back seat for the most of the time like yeah she, she should be she's so great <laughs> she's normally the one front and center and she does a fantastic job with what she's mm-hmm. with the, what little screen time she's given but like and again even the little girls give fucking great performances i i don't know man i i wish more people would have seen this movie at when it came out yeah and recognize the talent because this is like a, not a movie we get often like yeah for me this is if not the number one one of the best thrillers ever it's great it's incredible yeah 
Like this was another this was another movie where I was like ashamed of myself that I hadn't <laughs> seen this yet. You know what I mean? I'm shocked you had not seen that yet. Until <laughs> right. It was time to watch it. I think less of you. I get it. I get it. I, look, I, as I've established this season, I hate myself. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this whole overall tone of the film, I don't know if you guys realized it. It's depressing. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you guys caught this. <laughs> there, if you look real closely. Child, child abduction is really depressing. <laughs> yeah. If you look real closely, you'll notice this movie is sad. <laughs> no, it, like I... It is an unrelenting bummer. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's wet and snowy and dark outside. And this movie's shot in Georgia. Oh, okay. And it's, it's meant to be Pennsylvania. They, they did a great fucking job. I didn't recognize this was Georgia at all. Yeah. Oh, not at all. I mean, I have a lot of small little notes, but I think I've spoken my piece about the majority of the movie and on as a whole. Do you guys have anything else we forgot to talk about? I mean... I've got still plenty to go, but in terms of the big character moments and stuff. I will say this is around the moment when I stopped taking notes. Like okay. the last 20, 25 minutes, I could not look away from the screen. I was just fully engrossed. Well, let's talk about the um, Loki going to uh, the Joneses' houses and rescuing Anna and killing uh, yeah. uh, Melissa Leo. Like how was how great is that sequence of him oh. having been shot in the temple and then having to drive in the rain at high speeds at oh my night God. through intersections with a little girl. There's a moment when I stopped breathing. Yes. <laughs> I think it was when he looks over his shoulder and the foam is coming out of her mouth. Yes. And, and, I, she's, yes. Yeah. and he says, he says, it's all right, sweetie. Stay with me. And he turns around and it is almost like he's looking at fucking like hyperspeed. Like, yeah. it is, there's a moment there's there, eventually oh I, I i feel like i'm just repeating myself over and over again when i just say yeah this was great this was so good like so well done it's so intense like but it is it's incredible yeah, before i even started taking notes i wrote my first note literally said this is going to be two hours of me just gushing so strap the fuck in sure because <laughs> i i've got nothing negative to say about them by the way the the guy who played uh mr jones in the photographs yes. is uh dennis christopher who played eddie casbrack in the 1990 version of it oh okay i thought he looked yeah. familiar yeah yeah all right oh i wanted to also piggyback off of something you were talking about with the um the, the the rescue scene at the end with loki yeah he is you know he's driving and he's like oh come on stay with me you're gonna be okay anna yeah and as it keeps going he's he just saying he just keeps saying don't die yes don't die yeah and then you know seeing the hospital pulling in and you know literally slipping out of the car and running on the snowy ground to get to her it's so fucking good and yeah the movie does two moments where in the middle of this incredibly tense moment of Loki's rescue, it fades to black. Yeah. Because when he when he hears Alex in the house yeah. and he's walking up to the shower to rescue him, it just fades to black. And it does the same thing when he runs into the ER with, with Anna. Yeah. And I, I, that's an interesting choice. It is an interesting choice. It also plays it very um, ambiguously with Alex because, you know, the, the, the captain comes out and he doesn't say... Uh, you know, the he's dead or what he just says, we have to notify the family. Yeah. And that's that's it's left at that. Like, we're just like, OK, so is he did he and you don't get that until until the newspaper. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that you know that he's alive still. No, I think what my interpretation of that is by the time Loki gets to that point in his story, mm -hmm. he he's essentially done doing his job. Yes. Right? Like he finds Alex, he's he rescues him from from being kidnapped. His his part in that in in that uh in that case is done. Yeah. Right? And then same thing with rescuing Anna. He's done his job, he's the hero, and that's all that needs to be said for him. And that's why they fade to black. They don't show you right. the joyous moment because now he's done being a cop, right? right? Yeah. That's that's how I took it. But I I mean, I don't know. Who knows? Because it is such an interesting choice. They only do it twice. Um, the And the sequence with, uh, with Holly and Keller, uh, you know, facing each other down mm -hmm. is, is so... Yeah, Melissa Leo's scary as hell when that turn happens. She's so scary and she's so... He's he's he seems pathetic yeah. in that in that moment it's the it's the you know he it's the moment where it seems like he has finally admitted that he has no control over the situation well he he tries yes his hardest to to stay in control even saying if you want me down in that hole you got to shoot me and then she fucking does she, it she fucking does it and then he falls into the hole like a gimp like it's pathetic how yes. he falls in there and then yeah i 
finding the whistle the, yeah, finding the whistle and and maria bello saying like oh she says that she found her whistle before she was taken but she must be confused yeah like all these little little bits that like tie back into the opening of the film oh yeah the foreshadowing that her whistle's gone missing was incredible Oof. i never even picked up on that really before well, yeah as far as the rescue scenes go like um you know loki didn't even want to go to back to the house mm-hmm. alex's house and talk to that's true you know and um Whenever she answered the door, she had like the the towel over her hand saying she burned herself. But, Mm -hmm. you know, in all reality, you know, it ended up being the gun and she got the upper hand of Keller. Mm -hmm. And if she would have just um, let Loki tell her that Alex was fine, Mm -hmm. then nothing would have really happened. But, you know, obviously she knew. And then uh, Loki found the uh, picture of her husband and that just kind of connected everything together, which. Yeah. Like, I think at one point earlier on in the film. When Keller was hiding things from Loki mm-hmm. and then he found out something that, uh, you know, he was like, everything matters, which ultimately everything that happened in this film connected back to each other. Yeah. yeah. So it was just, you know, full circle. Yeah. It's, it's like a maze that you get out of. <laughs> right. And and I will say there is kind of an interesting parallel to life here. <laughs> the other Hall we did this year. Oh, boy. OK. There's a high speed misdirect because we have in life the two pods shooting off in different directions. And the way it's edited, we think one is going to Earth and one is spinning out and it's the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. This time we have Loki chasing Keller and he goes, I know where you're going, you son of a bitch. I know where you're going. Yeah. And then he goes to a different place. Like, yeah. in it, but it's shot. It's edited in such a way that we think that the, you know, the chase is connecting and, you know, differently than it does. And I, I love that. I, I mean, I would have probably gone back to the apartment, too. Like, they oh, sure. That's where they were going. So, of course. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. So, um, like I said, I have a few other little things I want to cover that, mm-hmm. I, that I think are worth talking about that I didn't have a, a point to really uh, to cover. Yeah. Uh, I did not know that cops not liking fortune cookies was a stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been, uh, yeah, very strange. What? <laughs> yeah, when he when we first get introduced uh, introduced to Loki, he asked the waitress for a uh, fortune cookie. She said, yeah. "I thought cops didn't like those." Yeah, my boss said they don't like them or something. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I never knew about. I mean, that seems like it would be a thing. Sure. But first, I'm hearing of it. <laughs> That's weird. Hugh Jackman. We've already talked about two of them, but he had three movies released in 2013. Mm. And without you guys looking it up, I'm curious to know if you can. Get guess what the third one is because Mm -hmm. we've mentioned obviously this movie prisoners and we mentioned the wolverine Mm -hmm. the third one is intriguing to me was it rise of the guardians it was not okay it's a documentary i'll say that oh was it not oh i I always figured it was chappy Mm -mm. chappy was a documentary (laughs) (laughs) it's the crystal lake memories documentary that tried to he plays himself in it so he i guess he must have talked about being a fan i i i I, I don't know i've seen crystal lake memories i don't remember that it's on his imdb it's it's listed as his the third movie that came out it just says as himself that's interesting i don't like that (laughs) i was like wait is hugh jackman in in one of the friday movies but he's not he's not um i wonder i wonder if he like auditioned for one of them or something or maybe like executive produced one i think or maybe he is Corey feldman (laughs) secretly he is jason oh my god (laughs) yeah i mean you know if if we're going by jason goes to hell rules he could have (laughs) hopped into hugh jackman at some point that's very true and made him make the greatest showman (laughs) yeah let's see here 2013 so you got prisoners oh it's not even listed here the movie 43 came out in 2013 oh god boy that was a rough movie um but no on wikipedia it listed in there let me go back and look on imdb it's not showing that there that's so strange Uh, oh i know why because it's I need to be list actor and self appearances separately. Ah. But let me look it up here on uh, IMDb. Sorry, listen, we got to figure this out. Yeah, no, th- I have to know. <laughs> I must say, before I uh, hopped on, you know, recording with you guys, I was in the middle of listening to your outstanding A plus Freddy versus Jason episode. <laughs> 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 what, the, what the fuck, guys? <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. I got to the part, you guys talking about fake tits and yep. everything, and I was like, oh boy. Oh, so you. Yeah, it gets worse from there. Well, I think we did it with a little bit more of a deft hand. The <laughs> thing is, it makes sense, too. They are the worst boob jobs I've ever seen in horror movies. Yeah, well, again, well not to shame the women, but the surgeons that did it. Jesus right. Christ. Yeah. Um. Anyway, yeah. Crystal Lake Memories himself. Yeah, I see that. No idea. Crazy. Yeah. Good. I'm glad he's... I'm glad. <laughs> you know, he probably needed the work. Yeah, def- definitely. He only had three X-Men movies the next year. <laughs> well... 
that <laughs> is incredible. Loki calls the priest a fucking chicken hawk, <laughs> which is an insult that I've never heard before. It's real good. Yeah, <laughs> it is real good. Also, we didn't talk about this and I never put it together, but do you guys know what Paul Dato's character's full name is supposed to be? Uh, No, I don't. I don't remember. His name is Alex Jones. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, I know. I laughed about that a couple of times in the well, movie. I laughed with the chief says... Uh, and as far as Alex Jones, he's been ordered not to leave the Commonwealth. And I was like, boy, I fucking wish. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Loki's character wears um, a Freemason's ring. And I got to say, this is something that I've just never been fully clear on. I don't understand what the Freemasons are. And I never quite understood. But he's got a Freemason ring on. Uh -huh. So I, do you guys know anything about Freemasons? Can you fill me in? It's something I actually did research into this a long time ago. And now I, I it's something that's like kind of faded into my brain i i don't quite understand it yeah i feel like every time i read I, it goes in one ear and out the other yeah i don't re retain the information i get from it so nobody knows okay <laughs> i'm not sure either but he also had like i think the star david tattooed on the side of his neck yeah so i think it just goes along with the religious undertones of the whole movie to where i suppose you know yeah i have no idea I want to give a shout out to the production designer of this movie because I thought uh, Hugh Jackman's Doomsday basement looked incredible. Like yes. it was so fucking intricate with how much stuff was in there. It's almost like a Where's Waldo. You could pause and just look at everything. Mm -hmm. It was really incredible. I almost got to say for him to have that much stuff for like, you know, in case the end of the world happens. Yeah. He can't, you know, give half. A couple thousand bucks for his son to get a car. That's mm. true. Come on, man. That is true. That yeah. poor bastard. Yeah. <laughs> that basement is filled with stuff. Stocked. Yeah. Um, I do want to give... A, we've talked about Paul Dano's performance and how great I think it is, but I do think he also does one thing in this movie that I think is overlooked. The, sh the scalding shower scene. Oh, my God. Where you just see, like, a sliver of his face. Yes, yeah, but, but more so in his performance, because I think... A lot of times in movies and TV shows that characters that are being tortured don't ever truly convey mm -hmm. the sense that I think would be genuine for someone who's actually being tortured. Does that make sense? Yeah, like, but there's also the extra layer of him barely understanding why. Yes. All he knows is that he's hurting. Yes. And yeah, but there's a there's a certain tinge in his voice and there's an octave mm -hmm. that he reaches that I'm like, no, that's what being tortured would sound like like yeah it almost is like this wailing kind of like high pitched kind of string yes. and i feel like in it, a lot of performances don't ever get there but i think that's why he's one of the best he's able to do it i feel the pain that he's in and then mm -hmm. seeing the steam coming out of the pipe oh my god yeah it's 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 gruesome and i and you don't even see it yeah and it's fucking gruesome it's almost one of those screams that like if i played it way too loud and people outside heard it, they'd probably call it. People cop. think it's real. Yeah. Which is, that's surprising me to how, like, um, if I remember right, he, Loki heard him screaming from inside the house, right, when he found him? Yeah. So I'm surprised no one called the cops whenever they heard him getting his shit kicked in right with a jackman or when the hugh jackman hammering the sink <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah i think i think they can't hear him until because he smashes the window at that one point yeah. and then i think it's still a little bit off the beaten path to the where you probably wouldn't even think twice about it until you were like close by yeah it doesn't look like the greatest area where that exactly yeah and dude the shot of when he tries to go after viola davis and he's got that glass shard oh, it is yeah scary like yeah. the shot the, the beautiful shot in the like the the reflection of the medicine cabinet and just the 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 close-up on his hand clutching the glass mm -hmm. it's so fucking good like god i'm i'm just gushing more about roger deakins but every <laughs> shot is like that in this movie there yeah. is not a single wasted shot in this movie it's incredible everything has a point yeah and like somehow he's able to do things with shadows that no other dp can do because like even his silhouettes yep. are distinct i mean it's a silhouette they should all look the same his look better yeah. somehow i don't understand how he does it that dude is incredible um melissa leo's character has got zero trigger discipline because <laughs> <laughs> when she makes hugh jackman back up the trans am she has got that finger on the trigger <laughs> so one did did the timeline of this film make you guys think it was longer than just like 
five to seven days. I thought it was shorter. Um, For me, it felt really quick. Like it was day after, like it was one day after the other. They, yeah, it's seven. I think it's seven days total yeah. because mm-hmm. when when he uh, confronts him outside the liquor store, he says it's been six days. Um, well, no, he says it's been a week, and he says no, it's only been six days. Right, right. And then he and then Hugh Jackman starts having the meltdown in the car. Yeah, which is incredible. Yeah, I was to say one of the things that like I didn't realize till this rewatch is they did a so originally i thought that they actually like i guess because it was between thanksgiving and like christmas Mm -hmm. you know how people usually put up their christmas stuff way too early yep or right after thanksgiving um i guess i thought up until this rewatch that like it was like a month Mm -hmm. between you know how long like they were captive but then i right. re- realized in this rewatch that they like actually it's a very compact timeline yeah mm-hmm. yeah that they actually like mentioned like it's only been this many days it's been this many days so they like focused on like what the timing was of um the kids being lost and then how long he's been lost and you get that t- that ticking clock is so important to the tension of this movie i mean yeah. there's the that's how he convinces franklin to go along with them keller says it's been five days since they've had a sip of water yeah mm-hmm. which is like a crushing moment yeah and and then he says that to Loki too. He says kids that have been missing more than a week have like yeah. half the chance of being found, and then almost and never then after a month, almost never. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah, the the manipulation, uh, the mental and emotional manipulation that that Keller pulls on on Franklin is yeah. But it, but then also that that appeals to Loki's ego, which we don't see a ton like mm-hmm. on Front Street in this movie, but he he that's what flips him out is he just like i don't fucking lose you know what i mean like he goes it that's why he argues the semantics of it hasn't been a week yep because loki doesn't lose a case yeah well yeah he's so good he could tell off his captain yeah and be like just let me do my shit why don't uh do me a favor and go fuck yourself captain is that what he says something like that yeah so good shut the fuck up captain yeah with a guy with a perfect track record do you really argue with him i mean the captain puts up a decent fight i think but he's the dr house of detectives yeah yeah <laughs> so let's let's recap the ending for those who may not be uh aware or maybe fuzzy on the details so sure. uh loki pieces things together and goes to the jones's house um to to confront uh mrs jones he walks in sees her about to inject anna with um something in, in some kind of a syringe yeah and mrs jones not to be outdone or you know giving up the ghost says before she tries to shoot loki <laughs> says well make sure they cremate me i don't want to be buried in a fucking box <laughs> right and she says it with oh, such resignation it's such like a no country for old men kind of moment it's like yes. a, a duel that's about to start yeah she fires up a shot grazes uh loki's temple he puts two in her <laughs> oh. <laughs> i'm just gonna gloss right over that he puts some bullets in her uh rescues anna throws her in the back of his cruiser and you see that uh the bullet wound that he's he's got is uh it, it's just a bloodbath like he, he the more he's driving yeah the fuzzier his vision's getting the bloodier his wound is and this is already a real blinky guy yes and uh, <laughs> now he's got now he's got blood in his face he's just soaked with blood and is in the back seat just just foaming at the mouth Ugh. he finally gets her to the er i'm getting tense remembering like just here <laughs> like just hearing your description of yeah. the scene i'm literally just like i'm seeing yeah, the yeah. pov shots of the road through the snow fuck it's it's incredible we should also mention that uh miss jones got the upper hand on hugh jackman's character and forced him into a hole in the backyard that's covered up by an old trans am right she even makes a comment that's like maybe i'll toss your daughter's body down there with you or something like that it's yeah. just fuck dead corpse down there with her yeah yes and another we're given another ticking clock because she shot him and she says make a tourniquet maybe you'll last 24 hours yes because she shot him in like the uh the thigh or like the, the yeah above the knee yeah mm-hmm. he finds anna's whistle down there uh the missing whistle that she mentioned at the beginning of the movie mm-hmm. and so loki gets anna to the to the hospital uh hugh jackman's character is is nowhere to be found no one knows where he's at it's been a couple of days yeah i think after it has to at least been a day because there's a newspaper article that says he's still missing right um we find out alex has been reunited with his family uh after 26 years yep uh what's her name uh maria bello comes in and and you know introduces anna to loki yeah and then she kind of confronts Loki and is like, hey, my husband's gonna go to jail for all the shit he did and he's like yeah probably (laughs) yeah and that's kind of where we leave uh, the, the the Heller family, right? I, yeah, I have a question about mm-hmm. Anna. Mm-hmm. 
Um, the way that it is played is so ambiguous, and I can't tell if Anna is shell shocked or if the stuff she was injected with did something to her. You know what I mean? I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah, honestly, I thought that too up until um the very because she looks like she's almost like just still zoned out. Yeah, zoned very, out. yeah, zombied out. Yeah, yeah. At the very end, when she's like being like out of camera angle you could see her like wave or say bye oh okay yeah so maybe she was shy and a little bit out of it and you know stuff like that because there's a moment it's so sad because uh you know maria bello is so happy to have her home and she says like she wanted to thank her hero and i'm like this kid's not saying anything and there's there's kind of a recognition in loki's face where he kind of looks at her and gives like a like he kind of scoffs a little bit like he can't help himself like he just I, it feels like he doesn't see this as a victory he doesn't i don't think he does at all yeah yeah, yeah the case not finished yet in his mind and also i think this case maybe it broke him yeah he may recover from it but i think this is definitely the hardest case that emotionally that he's ever had to put up with yeah also they have a scene earlier in the movie. I'll finish recap in a second. But Maria Bello and him have a scene earlier. Oh, yeah. That I do think had some significance because it's never really brought up and he never really answers her. But when he first goes to talk to them, uh, the hellers in the house, and he says, you know, she's like, oh, did we pass the lie detector test? He goes, yes, your cooperation's appreciated. And then right before she breaks down, she says, do you have any kids, detective? Mm-hmm. And he doesn't answer. Oh. I, my theory would be that he doesn't. But... The fact that he doesn't answer in his very next line is just, you know, we're, we're going to find them or something. I wonder if there is some kind of... Yeah. Because he does seem like he would be like like the backstory that you can imagine in your headcanon is like he got way too into his job and like it drove a wedge between his wife and kid and they left him. And yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. I could see him having... Uh, um, What's his name from True Detective? Like Russ Cole, is that his name? I yeah. can feel like him having that kind of apartment. Like it's just right. a mattress and a cross on the wall or something. <laughs> Uh, but we never really get into Loki that much. And I think that's an interesting decision because usually detective movies are all about the character. Right. He wears. I mean, that's the thing is he carries all of that history in his face. Like yeah. it's just one of those performances where you can see a life in it. Mm-hmm. But yeah. So uh, they forensics decide to to start raising uh, Miss Jones's uh, uh, land. And, you know, they're like, oh, we found some dead snakes and mm-hmm. some stuff. But the. But the ground is frozen solid. It'll take us, um, you know, months to excavate. Mm-hmm. And um, we know that that Hugh Jackman is there, like he's right there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Loki even quotes him saying, "Like, uh, pray for the best, prepare for the worst," mm-hmm. uh, which is a great line. Um, and then as he's kind of in there reflecting, there's a very faint, very faint sound of a whistle that uh, Loki kind of turns and looks around and then kind of just brushes off. But then he hears it again and turns back. And that's kind of where we just leave the movie. Yeah. The, the movie ends with a will he find Hugh Jackman before Hugh Jackman dies kind of thing. Yeah. And like I said, the movie just cuts to black and then the title just fades up. It's a very quiet ending. There is no fanfare. Well, the, you, did you see the post credit scene? Oh, where, boy. Uh, he <laughs> snicks his way out of the, like, the, the claws <laughs> pop up from the ground. I did not see that. It must not have been on my copy of the movie. Oh, um, man. Well, you got to flip the disc over. <laughs> oh, that's why I didn't see it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I do think this movie does get a little bit, uh, the ending gets a little overblown mm. um, with people that discuss it because um, there's a lot of people that I've seen discuss this. Oh, does he, do you think he heard the whistle? Do you think he finds him? And I'm like, I don't think it's as ambiguous as like the top spinning at the end of Inception or something. I think it's pretty <laughs> sure. clear. Yeah. I think it's pretty clear Loki hears it and he's going to find him. Yeah. But people debate over it. So uh, that's just my two cents. And also that's still not a happy ending because no. Keller's going to jail. <laughs> you know, it, the, the next scene is, yeah, is Loki pulling the wood off of that hole and Keller being me and like, help me holding his gun on Keller. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's almost like you see Keller's like whole personality and you're like, his daughter's safe. Mm -hmm. Whoever abducted her is gone. I'll go to jail for that. His faith has reasserted itself. Yes. Um, and I, I think it's pretty obvious that he find he finds him after that, but he finds him. I believe. Yeah. 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 But I also don't think maybe this is just my interpretation. Mm -hmm. I don't think Hugh Jackman's character learns anything. Yeah, I agree. I think the next scene with, with Jake Jonah pulling him out of the hole and cuffing him, I don't think he's learned anything. Mm-mm. Even at the news that his daughter's safe and everything, I think his wife 
is not by his side at the trial. Like, I don't think I think his character is just. Oh, see, I, I do think that really I think yeah, that I think, so I think Maria Bello stands by him because well, she says like he's a good man. He did what he did to save our daughter. But I also get a tinge in the way she's talking to him like he's probably going to jail. And yeah, yeah Jake that's Lundgren true. Yes, probably. I feel like it's her being like, I, I don't. I can't justify because she doesn't fully know. I don't think, right? No. I mean, I would assume the details around Alex and his torture and everything is still private because they're still conducting, uh, they're still doing business on that case. Yeah, it's it's definitely played in that part is played ambiguously for sure. Yeah, I think once the details comes out about what he did to Alex, that I don't think. I mean, she has to know enough, right? Well, I think she she has to know something to put the two and two together that he's going to go to jail. So true, but I also think it's like. She was left out like Viola Davis was there. Franklin was there. They were all there doing this to this kid and she was left out of it. She was drugged up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he was the one giving her the drugs. Like you see him trying to, to force drugs into her. <laughs> I mean, that's my head canon is like I said, I, I think she's like, yeah, that that that's a divorce waiting to happen. If anything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I think at the point where like he did give her the pills, because I mean, she was already like begging to go to sleep. So mm. she was obviously like something was going on and yeah. she was like, you know, drinking or, right. you know, doing pills, all that stuff just to kind of zone out of what reality was. I do like too, that even in her, her quote unquote doped up state that like when Loki comes back and she's like, Oh, and it was here. She opened the window and he's just kind of like rolling his eyes and he sees the pills on the side. But then that comes up in his investigation later. That's like very important news that he figures out mm -hmm. so it's like even this like quote-unquote delusional woman that's like just spouting nonsense because she's drugged up it turns out she's right mm -hmm. which i thought was a, a definitely a, a good twist on that trope you know what i mean like oh this crazy woman who knows what she saw blah blah and then yeah but yeah that's i think that's what makes this ending so great is that you can have that whole well what happens next discussion and like it's it is up for debate in terms of what comes next, but I think it's obvious that definitely Jill and Hall finds him. Oh yeah. All right. Was well, there anything else we want to talk about before we get into the wrap up and all the extra little segments here? We have gone through all my notes. Like I okay. said, I was just I was glued <laughs> to the screen. I might even put this movie back on again tonight. I'm <laughs> I have it's been a while since I watched it, and it's it's one of those movies I could watch anytime. I was thinking about putting on Blade Runner actually. Ooh, after this. that's Blade a good Runner twenty forty nine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm done with my whiskey, so I think we can get into the end. <laughs> <laughs> I drink, I drink whiskey done. and you drink your you know GHB Kool-Aid. I'm, I'm almost done with my ketamine, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I didn't want to outdo myself. We'd already done whiskey for Planet of the Apes, and I never want to repeat my, my cocktails. So. <laughs> sure. But yeah, let's get into uh, Prop Cop. And for the new listeners, this is uh, the part of the show where we decide which prop from the movie we want to own for ourselves. So yeah. there's lots of props in this movie, lots of good choices. This is essentially just a fantasy collection of items that we have uh, in our possession. So, Kobe, let's start with you. Um, what's a prop from the movie that you think would be cool to own? You know, I, I the whole movie, because like I said, I, I know this is a segment of the show. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, what do I want from this film? <laughs> and honestly, it's the fucking jacket that Jake Gyllenhaal wears, because yeah. I swear to God. Yes, sir. Some of these people have the best goddamn jackets I've ever seen, like yes. in Blade Runner 2049 <laughs> and Blade Runner. with uh, uh -huh. They're just the best jackets. I want that jacket. I want to be cool like Jake Gyllenhaal. Dude, he looks like a beast when he walks up on the RV the first time at the gas station. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. He looks incredibly like yeah. he looks like a giant walking on that up to the RV. It's incredible. Um, Nathan, what about you? Uh, OK, so I'm kind of uh, stretching the rules here. Oh, I boy. want Loki's dope fucking tattoos. <laughs> OK, so we're just all we're just ripping off. We're just declothing him, detattooing. Him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, can I just say I want Jake Gyllenhaal? Is that is that a prop I can take? That's totally fine. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, no, no. I, he seems like a good hang. <laughs> no, I I had a there was a couple that I thought would be really cool to own. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at him here. I pulled I pulled a couple. Like I thought the maze necklace was really cool. That's on the corpse in the priest basement. Oh sure. Uh, I thought the the whistle, the the homemade maze mm. coloring book kind of thing that David Dasmachi makes. Yeah, but. It's such a tiny little prop, but I like the little toy RV car. Oh, sure. That he that um, he has on his desk. Yeah. I think that's such a cool. It's a little Hot Wheel. That's and, a cool one. Yeah. Yeah. It, for some reason, I was like, I, I kind of want that <laughs> <laughs> to go with your Breaking Bad playset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, let's get into bit part. So this is uh, which 
featured extra or background character do you think would be cool to uh to to star as in this movie so like sure. you, you replace this person in the movie oh this is new <laughs> oh yeah so i'll give you time to think about it uh, uh kobe yeah i so the one i would go with is there's a cop that's in the background he's very blurry but when gyllenhaal smashes his keyboard mm-hmm. there's a dude over his shoulder who kind of looks at like looks at him like what the fuck like there's like <laughs> sort of a like a kind of like i can't believe this sure sure uh, i want to be that guy uh it's funny you mentioned that because my second choice was the other cop that is watching uh david through the the, the one-way mirror oh sure and then when jay john hall goes in there and starts slamming his head on the desk he's like oh shit and he runs in there oh yeah i think that might actually be the same guy oh okay yeah, i was like that might be <laughs> the, he, yeah i think it is that... or oh, then i could play the other cop that's in that scene too because there's but perfect but no i, I ultimately what i chose was i want to be the dead body in the priest basement <laughs> <laughs> strapped to the chair that makeup was incredible right? i mean i don't know if that was a prop or like if that was an actual person with makeup. It's probably not a person. I think, if yeah. I had to guess, it's not a person. But I, it's really well done, though. I want to be that guy, or even to the priest. I just want to be hammered drunk on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kobe, can you can you think of a, a cool extra part that you'd want to play? Oh man! If you're struggling, I got some suggestions. I think would I be mean, great. Something for you. <laughs> like as minor as this was, the uh, the daughter of Viola Davis and Terrence Howard. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> the one that says "fuck you" to Viola that. Davis. Both. <laughs> That line is great. Something about the sass when they were knocking at her door all worried. And she's like, man, fuck yourselves. And, you know, I was just like. She busts out and says, fuck you both. Why don't you tell me the next time you leave? <laughs> like, what was she going through during this whole moment of having her sister right? abducted and her parents are like all freaking yeah. out? She didn't give a fuck. Well, that's what's scary is you think you think maybe she got taken too. Like, yeah, yeah. That, it's a good little like mini twist on that little scene right there um well i was gonna suggest if you wanted another part to play you could play the uh the, the lady at the uh clothing store oh yeah <laughs> that that loki talks to that she's like oh yeah paul dato came in here and felt up a mannequin she's good <laughs> she's really good man i don't know if i want to play a thrift store worker that, that seems scary <laughs> there you go you might get some david desmontians in there uh, his his line delivery of like i can't afford to shop at brooks brothers <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. He's in a suit and tie when he opens the door. It's yeah. such a good, good look. And then, of course, he's got, he's got such a great face for movies, man. Like yeah. it's you, you get so much with so little with him. It, he's such an underrated character actor. He's Love so him. great. He's in Dune. I'm so I, excited I for to see him in Dune again. Yeah, can't wait. Well, uh, I only have a little bit of a trivia. I think we already talked about it. Yeah, that that uh, Ryan Gosling was going to star. Yeah. And uh, when it was Mark Wahlberg and Christian Bale were set to star and Brian Singer directing, they all just decided, fuck this, let's go make The Fighter. And they did. So so worlds kind of collided perfectly for this to be uh, one of the best movies ever made. Yeah. <laughs> By other people stepping down. All right. Well, let's get into uh, the crux of the show, the the namesake. Let's get into the silver lining of Prisoners. Um, I can go ahead and and start. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wrote down the obvious one just so no one would take it. Uh, the kids are all right. Yeah. So, <laughs> but that's actually not what I'm going to go with. Yeah. I'm not going to go with that one. I want to get that one out of the way because I think that's the obvious one. Sure. <laughs> okay. That, that we, so I'm going to take that off the table for us. I'm going to say Loki's track record is still going to be perfect. <laughs> sure. He's still, he's still got a perfect track record. He solved this case. So, um, Nathan? Um, Sort of along the lines of the obvious answer, but Alex went home. Yes. Alex got reunited with his family. And his parents got closure. Yeah. Uh, Kobe, what about you? Any silver lining? Uh, yeah, I mean, along the same lines, like, uh, I think it's crazy that the same whistle that the girls went after is what ultimately saved Keller mm-hmm. and her, his background, you know, survival instincts of preparing for survivals saved him. Yeah. And Loki is that damn good <laughs> um well i also uh, mally's not here um so i'm going to toss in another yeah. just to uh so we have a fourth one for him uh hugh jackman's rightfully gonna go to fucking jail for what he did to alex sure <laughs> that's so mally yes. i've met mally <laughs> once and that is fucking mally <laughs> I, I had a feeling he would appreciate that one so i i i almost think mally's would have been like uh uh, Holly Jones probably did get cremated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or um or like I bet that ketamine cocktail tasted really good or Oof. something weird like <laughs> purple drink. Purple drink. Uh what the fuck is juice? <laughs> uh, let's talk about the pick me up, the double feature yeah. for prisoners. So listener, if you've watched prisoners and you're like, "Hey man, 
uh you guys maybe watch this movie i feel pretty bad yeah i feel pretty pretty <laughs> shitty um uh, don't worry we're here to offer help uh we we give you a pairing uh, a double feature to watch after you watch prisoners yeah. to balance things out so um nathan what do you got for a for a double feature well if uh if prisoners left you feeling pretty bad i've got a- another movie starring prisoners that you might enjoy okay john carpenter's escape from new york oh, oh my god i i saw that movie for the first time this year oh and I wow am, like, how you said about kicking yourself for not watching prisoners sooner yeah holy shit i am so upset i never watched that movie sooner it's, it's fucking rules it's incredible i've never seen it either oh my god Kobe, you would love it yes please watch it as soon as possible it's incredible it's it's a it is a perfect it is a perfect lesson in simplicity yes. along the same lines that halloween is where it's just like Ah, there's like two set pieces and it's still just like this is a perfect 80s action movie. Donald Pleasant is supposed to be the president of the United States. It does not even bother doing an English yeah. accent like he yeah, like an American one. He and he wrote apparently like a 12 page like dissertation about how he could have become the president to justify it for his performance. And okay. he like took it to Carpenter and he's like. He's like, uh, so I, I was thinking that Maggie Thatcher actually took over part oh of boy. the Commonwealth. And and John Carpenter goes like, I don't fucking care. I just want to work with you, bro. <laughs> you know, I got to say, that's what I love about you guys and this podcast is you will always give me something to watch. Last yeah. time after Super, go. Mally told me to watch Hard Candy and that oh fucked my boy. life up Why for the a little fuck? bit. And that know. was the first watch. Oof. Yeah. Oh, my God. Why would he do? He's such a masochist. I swear to yeah. God. That, that was my fault because i brought up the the weird sex scene beside, between rain wilson and uh El, uh yeah elliot page yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. oh sure that's my fault <laughs> well uh that's not what i'm recommending uh, <laughs> uh i'm gonna say you should watch the blame it on the alcohol music video because jake gyllenhaal is in that and oh, i totally sure. forgot about that <laughs> But no, no, that's not my real one. <laughs> but oh, that is God. a good uh, buffer between two of them. I'm going to say um, if you like Paul Dano in this movie, uh, I think you'll also like him in a more upbeat, yeah. kind of silly movie, The Girl Next Door. Oh, sure. Oh. Such a funny movie. Um, Alicia Cuthbert, who has seemingly disappeared from Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. What's the other guy's name? Emil Hirsch? Yeah. Is that his name? Yeah. yeah. The first movie I ever saw Timothy Oliphant in. Uh, the girl next door. So we we did forget to mention that there's a lot of foreshadowing for the Riddler in this movie. Oh, that's right. That's what we we're going to talk about. <laughs> uh, yeah, Nathan, tell me about tell the audience about the screenshot you sent me. Oh, uh, there were a couple. <laughs> I this sent movie. I sent one that was uh, Paul Dano singing Jingle Bells, Batman smells, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the other one is Hugh Jackman leaning up to the 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 hole in the shower and going. No more riddles. Yep. <laughs> oh my god. Like, I was like, guys, we're getting we're getting a preview. Yep. Paul Dano is the Riddler. It's almost like uh, Christian Bale and Jared Leto <laughs> in American Psycho. <laughs> sure. I was gonna say it's uh, it, it pairs nicely with last week when we realized that Under the Cherry Moon was a prequel to to Tim Burton's Batman. Oh sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice, that's right. It's, it's a weird through line we've got going through this season. So yeah. Well. Kobe, what about you? Do you have a a, a double feature idea? Uh, yeah, so for me, I usually like to stick with the same kind of director style kind okay. of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I would go with uh, his uh, Arrival. Ooh, Arrival's a good movie. I, That's so good, man. Arrival's great. It's such a heady movie, too. It's it's intriguing. I, I hate that I missed that in the theater. Yeah. I, it's so great. The first time I tried watching that movie was the day after I graduated film school, and I was leaving for Los Angeles. Oh, wow. Like the next day. And, and you're just like, I'm a fraud. I, I, <laughs> that Well, there was that. But also, that was at Mally's apartment because I was just staying the night at his house to go to the airport in the morning. Yeah. He put a rifle on and I was out within like 20 minutes. So I had to go back and rewatch it later. But that was my first experience watching a oh, I fell asleep during it. But no, that is not a uh, a condemnation of the movie <laughs> at all. It's it's just a good movie. Sure. But yeah, Kobe, please watch Escape from New York Im immediately. It's a blast. <laughs> it is such... It exhumes John Carpenter's soul. <laughs> Dude, it's it's one of those. It's, I have the, you guys know me. I, like I have like two thousand films behind me mm -hmm. on physical media, and yeah. I have like twenty five hundred digital copies yeah. of things. Mm -hmm. Sure, I just get behind, and I end up watching. I, I'm right there with you, dude. There's, I get there's it. There's still a ton I haven't seen, so yeah, don't worry. Man. But it, when you watch it, I want you to keep in mind where Kurt Russell's career was mm -hmm. at this point, because he was a Disney kid. Yep, like oh, this no was way. his his play to become a a bona fide star like yeah. to the point where he's like 
he told Carpenter, like, I want to put an eye patch on. I want to do a deep, raspy voice. Like, he was trying to break out of being, mm-hmm. like, the fresh-faced yep. leading kid. God. Like, Kurt Russell is so awesome. It, 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 it's, it, it's, it's the equivalent of Zac Efron, like, doing, you know, a hardcore action movie. Or Robert Pattinson going from Twilight to Good Time. Like, sure, yeah. It, it seems like it's like Daniel Radcliffe doing all these, like, you know, like horns yep. and uh, Swiss Army Man, like you brought up Swiss earlier. Swiss Army Man, yeah. But uh, like, I, I'm assuming you guys have seen Bone Tomahawk. Oh my god, Bone Tomahawk yes. slaps. <laughs> we may even end up doing it on this podcast. I could justify yeah. oh, doing that. Please, please tell me that shit. That or um, Dragged Across Concrete uh, or Brawl in Subblock Ninety Nine. Give I me all make... that. Who, who is the director of those? Oh, who is the director of those movies? Because that dude fucking rules. Craig Ziegler is that, that his name? Dude makes some goddamn incredible movies Holy Craig Zaylor. yeah yeah um all right well last but not least uh do we recommend this movie kobe I'll, I'll start with you i have and i will again for the rest of my life okay yeah short and sweet i like it nathan what about you uh, i agree this movie is so good it there is a uh i mean like like i said it is a it's a downer it's like a but i think that the pacing and the performances uh it's such a compelling watch that it doesn't it doesn't feel like it overstays its welcome even though it's over two and a half hours long uh this man i this is one of those experiences where i'm just like man i really wish i'd seen this sooner it it's it's exceptional well i'm glad i i gave you a chance to watch it yeah Um, thank you (laughs) i I would say i absolutely recommend this movie but i will say make sure you're in the right headspace for something that's this emotionally debilitating and definitely Um, definitely that being said i think this is a must-see like there's few movies i would say on the podcast i'm like you have to see this movie this is one of them uh i would say almost all of denny villeneuve uh, Villeneuve's movies are must-sees but for me this is I, I said earlier this is like the most emotionally demanding thriller i've ever seen i think yeah. the weight of all the characters is so palpable and of course with not just kids but little girls being at the center of it all being missing it's incredibly demanding yeah but as you said the pacing is incredible it effortly uh effortlessly moves you along and it does something that's truly incredible because it it draws you in. Like, I truly feel at times like the character of Loki and at times like the character of Heller. Definitely. Like it, yeah. I'm I'm angry watching this movie. I'm confused. I'm upset. I'm frightened. I'm hopeful. It's like I said, it's that scene where Heller comes and confronts him. It, you don't know who you want yes. to get out of there. Yes. Fine. There's very few movies that could say they're over two and a half hours that don't feel like it. I think this is one. Wolf of Wall Street's one. <laughs> uh, the Lord of the Rings movies. Like, I don't feel the runtime. And I think the problem I have with movies that are over two hours is that most of the time I feel it. And it's because they're dragging. They, they don't justify yes, it. They, there's no reason to have it. Yeah. I'm never going to see this movie, but I'm so glad that Let There Be Carnage is 90 minutes long with credits. I, I almost texted you that where I was just like, hey, man, the, the Venom movie is going to be all killer, no filler. Oh, is that the new Venom movie? <laughs> yeah. Never going to see it, but I'm so glad it's I can't wait to never watch it. I can't wait. <laughs> Especially these days, like an hour and a half movie for me is like an easy like okay i'll watch it Mm -hmm. two hours i think about it two and a half i really have to like i have to be in the right mind space like you said to like really sit down and watch no matter what it is i might have mentioned this recently but like uh my horror movie podcast covered creep Mm -hmm. the mark duplass uh patrick bryce movie oh Mm -hmm. fuck that that's a great movie (laughs) it rules and i was also just like fuck it's like 77 minutes with credits. It doesn't even qualify as a feature, I don't think. No, we <laughs> we recorded that episode, I think, the same week that Silver Linings recorded the Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom episode. Mm-hmm. And I was Amazing just like, movie. this is a fucking salve. <laughs> this is like, I'm so happy that this is this is like under an hour and a half. No, I, I am very excited for No Time to Die. But I'm really hoping... I know, two hours and 45 minutes? I'm really hoping they justify that runtime. I really do. I don't want to feel it. That's my problem with those movies that are that Uh, long. I will... I will discuss my theories about that movie with you off mic. Okay. Because I... I have some fan theories that uh, I make me nervous about that movie. I don't know if I want to hear because I want to go in completely. Okay. Uh, I don't know. We'll talk about it. <laughs> maybe maybe I'll hold off. Maybe I'll hold off. All right. Well, listener, if you have some uh, some thoughts on the movie Prisoners, please email your uh, your feedback to us at the Silver Lines playlist at gmail.com. 
You can also DM us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Uh, if you haven't already, we ask that you please subscribe, rate, and leave some feedback on wherever you're listening to us right now. That is honestly the best thing you can do for our show. It helps others find us more easily mm-hmm. uh, and uh, alongside just sharing it with your friends and family and your followers and everybody else who is within earshot. Let them know about us. And um, if you haven't already, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and over on our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash the silver linings playlist. Ooh. Oh, actually, reddit.com slash r slash silver linings playlist. There's no the. Um, there's tons and tons and tons of info over there. So again, Mally's not here, but his movie, <laughs> this is twice now. I've had to give his clue yeah. back to back for his movie that's coming up next week. And also, Nathan, we didn't talk about this, but this is another P movie that we did this movie uh, this week, Prisoners. And <laughs> right. so is next week, which is another P movie. Uh, to the point where I took a movie off the list just so I wouldn't give us, like, mm-hmm. I think three mm-hmm. in a row. <laughs> yeah, it would have been three in a row. Um, but yeah, Mally's clue for what we're talking about next week. Uh, and that clue is next week's movie might have a better child murder then face off. <laughs> Jesus Christ. What? <laughs> what a bleak clue so to Mally's put at the obs- end of this Mally's episode. Obsessed, yes, exactly. The the synchrony, the, uh, the synergy there is it's incredible. <laughs> Mally's obsessed with the opening scene of Face Off where a child gets murdered immediately. Within, and- <laughs> yeah, within moments of the opening credits. And yeah. he's saying the movie we're doing next week might have a better child murder than that one. So, oh, oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, we got to get him in therapy. <laughs> um, anyway... <laughs> Uh, rest in peace, Oatmeal. And as always, I got nothing funny to say here, Nathan. I'm nah. just going to say Excelsior. Excelsior. <laughs> Excelsior. 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 Oh. Look it up. Hello YouTube! If you've made it this far, thanks! Could you do us one more favor? Could you hit those like and subscribe buttons? Maybe leave us a comment on what you think of the show. We'd really appreciate it. Join us again next week for an all new episode. Bye!